Hello world, this is Luke Johnson from Noetic.online, the humanities teaching website and social media company. Today is our 13th installment of Soren Kierkegaard's Training in Christianity, taught by Bob Shutt. Bob, what are we learning about today? Oh, today is uh, going to get a little theological here. Kierkegaard is really going to get into his theology, and we're going to see whether he's really a radical or whether he's a conservative or whether he's kind of right in between. <clears throat> so I, I think it's going to be interesting. And we're also going to read, I'm going to do a little something different today. I usually don't like to read a lot aloud when, when we're on doing these because I find it kind of is, uh, uh, what would I say, it, it doesn't grab people's attention. And uh, when you read, it kind of drones on. So I'm, try I'm going to try not to drone on. But there's words that Kierkegaard uses here in the text that there's no way I can improve upon them by trying to interpret them. So I want to read the actual texts, and then I feel I can comment on it a lot better. Okay, so that'll be a little different because I don't usually do that, but I really feel I have to do it. You know, I... Personally, I never had a problem when you read. No, oh. I, and and I actually think that people do uh, enjoy hearing the author in his own words. But that's uh, that's that's my own personal take. Okay, well, we will. Uh, I, I will do that, and hopefully, people will enjoy that. So we're we're at section three, page one fifty from our text, uh, and he starts off with a quote from John three thirty, John twelve verse thirty two. Uh, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto myself. And this has been repetitive. He's been quoting this verse all throughout. But I've also been doing, I also do something else. Look, besides this, I <laughs> believe it or not, um, I, I teach the Bible at our church and I'm teaching the book of Revelation. And when I heard reread this now, after having taught some of the book of Revelation, it means something a little different to me now. Uh, when John, we believe John wrote the book of Revelation, uh, when he writes this book, he includes a passage that he is told uh, in, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, it says this, it says, after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet taking, uh, talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit. And I, I'm, I'm seeing a similarity between that come up hither and what Kierkegaard is quoting here, that he will draw all men up to himself. Uh, he made last week, I think it was, he, or last two weeks ago, he made a big thing about drawing up. And I think that this is very uh, indicative of how God wants us to understand his word. He calls us up to him. And heaven was a place of spiritual enlightenment, spiritual understanding. So that's what the, the word really kind of should key in our minds when we hear uh, Jesus speak about heaven and John speak about heaven. We're speaking about a place of spiritual truth and spiritual understanding. And too many people try to bring God down to earth in order to understand him. And that's the fallacy. And that's where we run into all sorts of theological distortions because we try to make God an earthly creature. Rather, we must come up to God in order to understand godly things in a heavenly mindset. And so this is how I kind of teach the book of Revelation. It's not trying to bring the book down to our understanding, but bring us up to God's understanding. And I think Kierkegaard is really on to the same thing. He doesn't say it that directly, but I really think that that's what he's trying to say, is that we have to see things from God's point of view. That means we have to be elevated to heaven rather than to try to 
uh, turn what he's saying into something, some earthly wisdom. So now I will begin by reading something else that gives us a little revelation of Kierkegaard's theology. Who then is this that is lifted up? It is God's only begotten Son, our Lord, who from eternity was with God and was God, who came to earth, then was raised up to heaven, where he sits at the right hand of the Father, glorified with the glory which he had before the world was. He it is to whom all power is given in heaven and on earth. He in whose name every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. He to whose praise and honor eternity resounds and ever shall resound. He who shall come again upon the clouds resurrected, uh, I'm sorry, surrounded uh, by his holy angels to judge the world and to save those who have believed and are expecting his glorious appearing. So this is kind of what you might call a doxology. It's a statement of just bringing glory to God. But in it, he covers so much uh, theology. He covers Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God. Uh, Jesus was glorified in heaven. Uh, his name has become a name above all names, meaning that his name is now equal to the name of God. Uh, and he will come again in judgment. Kierkegaard is telling us everything that most uh, what would orthodox theology tells us. So we don't see anything unusual here in Kierkegaard's theology that says, oh, he was a weird guy, you know, he had like a cult following. There's nothing at all like that on Kierkegaard. So I'm kind of coming to his defense, if anybody were to think that he was some cultic leader. He's giving us straight theology right right, right from the book. Uh, this could be almost any major uh, denomination. Uh, so Kierkegaard now speaks, or he's going to speak about Christ's suffering and his humility. And his point here is that people... He says, people speak of the passion of Christ as though it was just a short period of time during the time of Jesus' crucifixion. And it's called the Passion. And that's usually what it implies. Even, even the movie was, was named the Passion because it focused on the crucifixion. But Kierkegaard sees Christ's whole life as a passion. So uh, that, that kind of changes the viewpoint a little bit. It wasn't just the last days of his life, the last couple weeks. It was Jesus' whole life was a life of passion. He says that people have abbreviated Christ's life uh, to the point of saying, okay, he was born and then he died. Or he was born, he taught a little bit, and then he died. Uh, and we celebrate this in an abbreviated manner with Christmas to celebrate his birth and Easter to celebrate his death. But what happens in between? Isn't there, isn't there something in between there, Luke? Yes. Yes. I mean, the one, so first of all, we, I, I think it's incredible that Christians <laughs> celebrate the Mass of Christ and Easter. I mean, these are totally pagan holidays, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. That... I think that's that's it's a really hard concept for a lot of Christians to get their mind around that essentially we got the uh cult of Saturnalia and uh Isis worship mixed in with Christianity. It's going to be hard to get people to get rid of Santa Claus and the Easter bunny. Um but yeah, lots of things happened. I think for me one of the most intriguing events that happened in Christ's life between his his birth and his death personally is when he was a young I, I don't know if he was a even a teenager. He might have been even younger. I think he was younger. I think he twelve. Was, yeah, when he went and uh, was philosophizing with mm -hmm. the with the rabbis and putting them through their paces and developing his dialectical skills, or maybe it's not proper to say he's developing his dialectical skills. Maybe he was developing their dialectical <laughs> skills. But it 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 it's one of my favorite. Uh, it's one of my favorite. Uh, accounts of the life of Jesus is when just think of this 
this young prodigy coming in and schooling all these learned masters. I personally like that one a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and then when he went out, he, he taught in parables. He taught lessons. He revealed who he was by, by his miracles. Um, so, so that whole dynamic that took place is kind of like foggy with a lot of people. Uh, mostly it's his birth, little baby Jesus, and then the crucified Jesus. And that's pretty much the big, the bookends. But there's not too much usually filled in between those bookends. Uh, and, and so Kierkegaard is trying to exploit that. He's trying to say, hey, pay attention. There's something that happened in between those two events. And he gives us one event here. He says Jesus was involved in a situation where he was asked about paying taxes. And he told them to look at the coin and look at the image that was on the coin. And it was the image of the emperor. And then he tells them to give to the emperor what is the emperor's and to God what is God's. And Kierkegaard calls this infinite indifference where Jesus separates the emperor and God to this infinite difference. So what's happening is that people are trying to make paying taxes here some kind of godly duty. They're trying to merge the two with this question, uh, trying to bring it together. Uh, this is what Kierkegaard is telling us. Uh, so people are trying to blend together God and the emperor in this question. Uh, and this secularizes God, makes him part of the political order. But Christ, with his answer, he polarizes God and the emperor rather than blends them. And by that I mean he sets them at opposite ends. You can either you know, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's on, on the opposite end. So people took Jesus' teachings, his miracles, and himself and they misunderstood them and took him in vain. This is kind of a quotation from Kierkegaard. Uh, they, uh, they misunderstood his relationship with sinners and publicans and became offended. And uh, that particular one uh, rang out to me because lately I've been kind of thinking quite a bit about how we perform ministries for people. Uh, well, many people have ministries, uh, but many think that working in a soup kitchen, kitchen, helping the homeless, helping alcoholics, etc., is some kind of a godly effort. But I'm questioning this in my mind. I'm questioning that are we enabling sin by doing such things? by providing comfort for people who are drug addicts and alcoholics and, and criminals of, of all sorts, perhaps, uh, are we helping sinners? Are we really doing, is that really what Jesus and the disciples did? Uh, and the answer is, well, there is no evidence that this is how Jesus helped sinners. But well, go ahead, what were you going to say? I was going to say... Yeah, I can see why you would. You, there's probably some people uh, whose monocles are shattering as you as you as you question <laughs> those those philanthropic efforts. Uh, uh, lest I remind everyone that it's okay to ask questions. Um, it would seem to me that those philanthropic efforts provide an opportunity to do the real work. Right, it gives us an opportunity to to evangelize, right? And 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 I think it, I think we have, I I think we have to contemplate the value of all the phil philanthropic efforts if we don't take advantage of that opportunity to evangelize and minister. It, it, have you been thinking along those lines at all, or are we connecting? We are. Uh, we're going to get into that, and that's a great point, because we're going to get into what then does it mean to really evangelize. Um, are we satisfied with providing uh, prostitutes with birth control? Are we always happy providing prostitutes with a place where they can have sex, but it's clean, 
and we can, you know, make sure that everything is okay and there'll be no no venereal disease or the needles that we give out to to drug addicts that they won't catch any kind of disease that they'll be safe they can safely inject heroin into their veins. Is that really a ministry <laughs> that we should be concerned about? The lunacy of that, right? I, yeah, yeah. I, we're gonna give we're gonna give you a clean place so you can put poison into your system. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, But when we look at the biblical context of this, okay, uh, the Bible is filled with stories of people who've come to their darkest moment, and at that point, they've become saved. They've realized they've made a big mistake. They've realized they're close to death or ruined their entire life. But now they come to that really important moment in their life and that's the moment of confrontation with God but it took them getting to the darkest moment so if we stand in the way of that darkest moment are we really helping a person come to salvation this is just just a one way of looking at this that, that I just want to bring up uh, so this is a question I really do wrestle with and I think we really ought to wrestle with it in order to come to the truth So, uh, I know that we need to provide the gospel to people. But we'll see the question, are we really providing the gospel to these people? Or are we becoming sidetracked and becoming some kind of a humanitarian movement that almost eliminates the gospel? Because we don't want to offend people with the gospel. Right? Far be it from us to offend anybody with the gospel. So it's something that we want to, uh, want to think about. But keep that thought in mind as we go because I, I'm going to try to bring it back up again. Uh, so Kierkegaard continues here. The race wanted to make Jesus the king. Remember while he was on earth, the, the race meaning the Jews wanted to make him the king. And this was a misunderstanding of his reign and his kingship. He was loved. Was there was there a movement to try to make him a, a temporal king? I, I just for clarification, I'm I'm not that I'm questioning that. I just don't know the particulars of it. Well, this was when he, when Jesus entered into the uh, into Jerusalem. They had the big parade for him, and they threw down the uh, the palm leaves and they they praised him and sang to him. Uh, and the claim was he was the king of the Jews. So yes, it was. It's not uh, when I say a movement, I don't mean a polit- you know, a, a maybe a organized movement. But this was the idea that he's the Messiah. He's coming to Jerusalem. He's now. We've got to make him our king. And so, uh, and Jesus even kind of thought this, and that's why he removed himself from certain situations. Yes, it wasn't. It wasn't organized. It was something that was organically emerging amongst the people. Yeah, well put. Well put, right. So Jesus was loved. This is Kierkegaard continuing. Jesus was loved and he desired to save men at any price. His message created the opposite effect in that they rejected him. So the message of love and salvation created not love and salvation so much in men, but the opposite. They rejected him. And eventually he was crucified. So one of the problems here. Uh, is that he says the pastor or the preacher deceives us when he tries to make it sound like he is walking with Christ in his sufferings. Or perhaps that we are all walking with Christ in his sufferings. These are imaginations and not reality. He ought to not simply think about it, but actually suffer with him. So he's saying we must participate with Christ and his sufferings. So we have a lot of people who are maybe idealists, who are thinking, reflecting. This is what he's saying, that people are reflecting on the idea of, well, I'm suffering, so I'm a Christian, so I'm walking with Christ, and I'm suffering along with Christ. He says this kind of suffering is not an abstraction and it's not a reflection of his suffering, but it's a reality. We must walk with Christ in his sufferings, not simply as a reflection, but as a reality. So it must be what he calls a view to action. So it's a point of view that we have, 
but it takes us to action. No one can say that he knew him when he entered into glory. Everyone must first know him in his lowliness. No one can say that they shared his lowliness with him because it's past 2,000 years ago. So Kierkegaard is kind of presenting a dilemma. The only way that we can really say we walk with Christ in suffering is to actually have done that, but that happened 2,000 years ago. So we really can't say in that way, in that reality, that we have done it. If you want to suffer with him, you must be willing to suffer in his likeness. This means to suffer in a purity of heart. So he, he's trying to say, make a difference between the way the pastor presents it or the preacher presents it and the way it really has to be thought of, the way it has to be lived out. So he's saying that the preacher is more in an abstraction. He's preaching it in an abstract manner, what suffering is, rather than preaching it as you must will to suffer. Man, we talked about the difference between wishing and willing, and this keeps coming up here. But the idea is to will to suffer is actually take part in it mentally with all, all of your being as much as you can. The one who loves Christ can understand it without the aid of eloquence. Uh, this, I like that. I like that verse that he gives us because uh, a lot of times pastors will kind of depend upon how eloquent they can present the gospel or their message. And Kierkegaard says it's not about eloquence. Uh, it's about love. It's about loving Christ. So uh, because we suffer in life, we can't call this suffering with Christ. He makes a distinction here. He says, just because you're suffering in life does not mean you are walking with Christ in this suffering because many sufferings are of a universal experience. What makes the difference is the attitude we have as we suffer. Now, as a Christian, we can suffer in patience and gracefully, but this is not suffering with Christ. Did you want to say something, Luke? You well, yeah, leave. I mean, I, I, I'm just trying to conceptually get my mind around it, and I don't disagree. Um, there's a very big distinction between the common suffering and the Christian form of suffering. Um, common suffering, if we were to define it a little bit more clearly, right? Yes. Uh, can be, can, can be, uh, it can take so many different forms, right? It can be from a matter of want. It can be from a matter, it can be from a perspective of excess. Uh, I, I, I live in a part of the world where I see this, I see a lot of suffering of excess. Um, I live in a rather well-to-do part of America, mm -hmm. and uh, the the access to resources is um, causing a great deal of systemic inebriation and drug addiction and adultery. <laughs> it's it's out of control. Yeah. Um, but the suffering for for Christ. If I were to get my mind around it, as someone, I guess who I guess I go through it right now is uh, it's a at least in the way that I experience it's a very it's a very subtle form of persecution. It's it's a the way that I feel it. It's a great it's a form of persecution that I I don't think I ever even really experienced before I became uh, I guess you would call born again. Um, but once you make that deeper more that that deeper turn to to faith, you realize how much of the world is actually in opposition to you. Mm -hmm. um, but to just, I don't, I wouldn't say that I've been physically attacked or anything like that. But there is right. every day you start to understand that you are in opposition to the world, and there's more than you even knew that is attacking you. And that's not from a paranoid perspective. It's just that. When you make when you have that conversion experience, and in my experience, is that you're given new eyes to understand who's on whose team and what you're really up against. <laughs> yeah. It's it's quite it's quite the it's quite the battle. You wake up every day and you're like, Oh, I guess I have to go out and fight this gigantic battle of good versus evil. 
And whereas before you were just kind of like, maybe you thought that life was kind of a matter of a blind chance and circumstances. But when you're given new eyes and ears, you understand, oh man, I'm on a side and I got to suit up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you better suit right? up. Right? I mean, do you, do, you know, do you know what I'm saying? Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah, I do. And, and Kierkegaard is going to, to tell us his, what he considers to be that kind of suffering. So we'll see if it plays right into what you were saying and it, and it kind of does. Is when we strive after the good, which means God's righteousness here, so that we could avoid the suffering if we stop doing the good. Which is what you were kind of what you were saying. If somebody is punishing us because we are doing the righteousness of God, and we know, well, you know, all I have to do is stop doing this, and they'll stop punishing me or persecuting me, then if we continue to do it, we are walking with Christ. So instead, we continue to pursue righteousness in spite of the suffering. Jesus suffered because he was the truth. And he would not be anything other than the truth. And this is what we really must preach. And this is really what we must do. So somehow this very, very important part of the elements here of what it means to, to walk with Christ is missing today in many places. So when somebody says, you know, I invested my money in the stock market and I lost all my money and now I don't have a house and the pastor puts his arm around you and says, oh, Bob, don't worry. You know, you're suffering with Christ. You know, consider that's not suffering with Christ. <laughs> Making bad investments in the stock market is not a suffering that comes about from doing God's righteousness. It's just one of those universal sufferings. But he says, when you suffer because you're doing the right thing, you're doing God's righteousness. And no, it'll stop. If you stop doing God's righteousness, that's what Kierkegaard says is walking with Christ in suffering. Okay, now I'm going to be a, long, a little long-winded here, but this is really worth telling, worth reading. Uh, I've, I heard this a long time ago in a, at least part of this, in a tape on Soren Kierkegaard. It was uh, I, I, a master's, master's of something, I can't remember now. Uh, but these were all, uh, this was a sequence of tapes, like you get Nietzsche or uh, Hegel or, or tapes on all these people. And Kierkegaard was it's one the, of them. Was this... The was this the greats of philosophy? Yeah, Is yeah, that, was yeah that the something like program? yeah, ma- yeah, great, the great masters, something like that. Uh, it, it's an all, it's all kind of uh, out of print, I guess you could say. Oh, I bet, I bet, I bet it's on the, uh, I bet it's on the the audio uh, book platforms now. I bet Audible has on it, has it on there, and maybe I can find it and recommend it to our listeners. Do you, oh, okay. Do, was it, is it something you would recommend? Yeah, yeah. It's it's a very good. Uh, there's two two tapes in it. If if people still have, have tape recorders, I don't know if it's on digital format now, but uh, yeah, I still have an old fashioned tape recorder, uh, and I listen to it on that. Uh, but. I, I only they only read a portion of it, and it didn't come across to me the way it should have until I read this whole thing. So let me do this. Look, I want you to listen to this too. So before, instead of looking for that now, wait till I finish, and then then you can look it up. Okay. So, he, so he's giving a story. He says, "Think then of a child, and give this child delight by showing it." Some of those pictures that one buys in the stalls, which are so trivial artistically, but so dear to children. This one here on the snorting steed with a tossing feather in his hat, with a, a, a lordly mane riding at the head of thousands upon thousands, which you do not see, with hand outstretched to command, forward, forward over the summits of the mountains, which you see in front of you forward to victory. This is the emperor, the one and only Napoleon. And so now you tell the child a little bit about Napoleon. This one here is dressed as a huntsman. He stands leaning upon his bow and he gazes straight before him with a glance so piercing to self-confident and yet so anxious. This is William Tell. 
you now relate to the child something about him and about that extraordinary glance of his explaining that with this same glance he has at once an eye for the beloved child that he may not harm him and for the apple that he may not miss it and thus you show the child many pictures to the child's unspeakable delight then you come to one which intentionally was laid among the others it represents a man crucified the child will at once nor quite directly understand this picture and will ask what it means why he hangs like that on a tree so you explain to the child that this is a cross and that to hang on it means to be crucified and that in that land crucifixion was not only the most painful death penalty but was also an ignominious mode of execution employed only for the grossest malefactors what impression will that have on the child the child will be in a strange state of mind it will surely wonder that it should occur to you to put such an ugly picture among the others lovely ones the picture of a gross malefactor among all the uh, heroes and glorious figures for just as a reproach to the Jews there was written above his cross the king of the Jews so this picture which regularly is published every year as a reproach to the human race is a remembrance which the race can never and never should be rid of it never should be re represented differently and it will seem as if it were this generation which crucified him as often as this generation for the first time shows this picture to the child of the new generation explaining for the first time how things go in this world and the child the first time it hears this will become anxious and sorrowful for his parents for the world and for himself and the other pictures surely as the ballad relates they must turn their faces away this picture being so different however and we have not yet reached the decisive point the child has not learned who this gross malefactor was with the curiosity children always have the child will no doubt ask who is this what did he do tell me and then the child and then tell the child that this crucified man is the savior of the world yet to this he will not be able to attach any clear conception so tell him merely that this crucified man was the most loving person that ever lived and uh th that that's the major content but now i want to read some of the other things he, he continues on but i eliminated some of his quotes here to make it a little bit shorter who does not uh so he's speaking about the one here and he says uh, who does not instinctively cast down his eyes and stand almost like a poor sinner the moment he must tell this to the child for the first time to a child who has never heard a word about it before what impression now do you think it will make upon the child who naturally will ask but why were people so bad to him well now the mother has arrived and uh, upon that tell him about the exalted one who from on high will draw all men unto himself tell him that this exalted one is the crucified man tell the child that he was love took upon him the form of a humble servant lived only for one end to love to love men and to help them then tell the child what befell him in life how one of the few that were close to him betrayed him and the other few denied him until at last they knelt him to the cross he prayed that the heavenly father would forgive them their fault tell the child that contemporary with this loving one there lived a notorious robber who was condemned to death for him the people demanded release they cried 
Viva! Long live Barabbas! But as for the loving one, they cried, Crucify! Crucify! This notorious robber became a kind of honest man in comparison with the living one. So what effect do you think this narrative will have upon this child? Continue with the story of the crucified one, relating that thereafter he rose from the dead on the third day, and then carried up into heaven. And you'll see that first the child will almost ignore this. The account of his sufferings will have made so deep an impression upon the child that he is not in a mood to hear about the glory which succeeded, or succeeded. Uh, so then, what effect do you think this account will produce upon the child? That he has entirely forgotten the other pictures you have shown him, and now he had got something entirely different to think about. And now the child will be in the deepest amazement at the fact that God did nothing to prevent this from being done. They did not understand that it was a voluntary terry suffering and that the humbled one uh, had in it in his power at every instance to pray and then the father would have sent him uh, legions of angels to ward off this terrible end. The more the child reflected upon the story the more his passion would be aroused for the child would have decided that when he grew up he would slay all the ungodly people. Uh, then, the child, then the child grew up to become a youth. And he thought that now he would understand it a little differently. He was not really able to slay all the bad people. Uh, so he had resolved, but nevertheless he would think with the same passion of combating the world, uh, the world in which crucified him and begged acquittal for the robber. When he becomes older and mature, he would understand it again differently. He would no longer wish to smite. I should attain to no likeness with him, with the humbled one who died. I will not smite even when he himself was smitten. So what he's saying is a little difficult there. What he's saying is, I'm not going to do harm to the people because if I did that, I wouldn't bring honor to the one that they, that they crucified. No, he wished not only one thing. He wished now only one thing, to suffer in some measure as he suffered in this world, which nevertheless crucified love and cried viva to Barabbas. The world has shown again and again on a smaller scale that not only he who humanly loves the good obliged to suffer, but that for the sake of the contrast for which the world has such a fondness, just to show how contrasted the world is to the good. There commonly lives at the same time a worthless, despicable, and base man to whom, by way of contrast, the world cries, Viva! So he, he's saying that with the good, there's always a contrasting evil, especially in the world today, where the world rejects the good and will praise the evil one. So I'm getting close to the end here. So, uh, so can the sight of this humiliation move? So it moved the disciples to know nothing save Christ and him crucified. Because it also moves there, uh, I'm sorry, uh, cannot it also move this man, move us? For why did this sight move them thus? Because they loved him. So why did it move the disciples to become disciples and become apostles? Because they loved Jesus. Who, uh, who loves him understands him that he was love. If this sight does not move you thus, it must be because you do not love him. 
For it may be that the sight of the humbled one in his sufferings may yet move thee to love him, who from, from on high will draw all men to himself. Okay, I, I, I know I read a lot there, but let me just kind of say that uh, these words remind me here of what the gospel really is and what we really don't hear today. The gospel has been, what would I say, not only uh, worn down uh, and, and dummied up, but we're missing a very key element. People must be brought to love Christ as Christ truly was, to love Christ as truth and righteousness, and not some folk hero, rock star, or motivational speaker, nor some storybook character. He must be thought of as one who can love with all... Uh, well, uh, he must be thought of as one that we can love with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind. And he says that God chose to manifest himself in this form so that we could love him in such a capacity. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, what's important about this section that I really wanted to make was that Jesus is not a cool folk hero, and when he's portrayed that way, it is borderline blasphemy. Jesus is the love of God who came as a human being for the purpose of helping us to be able to love God with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind. This is the gospel. This is the purpose of Christ. And so we, we must always keep that in, in the forefront. And uh, this is true, for, and, and I guess what Kierkegaard experienced is true for me. Uh, it wasn't always true for me, because in the beginning I thought of Jesus as a kind of sacred, sacred, maybe almost like an idol, you know, a religious ritual. He's the one we're supposed to pray to. And it was more this kind of thing, uh, r religious icon of Christ, rather than a being that we can actually love and be loved by God. And this is one of the differences between our faith, Luke, and between all the other religions. And check me out if you don't believe me. Our God can love us. He can love us. Christ is evidence of that love. That is, that is the gospel. And so that's kind of uh, where I wanted to, to sum it up. I know I read a lot. I'm not going to apologize for it because I think it needed to be read. But... Uh, I... I I won't get mad at you for it so long as okay. I don't get, get a <laughs> lawsuit for copyright infringement. <laughs> no, <laughs> it, it, no, no. I, I read it from Kierkegaard, so it's okay. Yeah, no, I'm not worried about it. Um, so many questions. Um, what do you think inspired the apostles to love Jesus in the way that they did. And there, and if I can just tack on a little bit more to that mm -hmm. is I I've come into a I've come into the um what's known I suppose as the truther movement. And there's a great revival going on in that truther movement. Um there are many people for the first time in their lives becoming Christians and they're they may have gone to, to Bible school when they were little mm -hmm. and taught songs about, oh, how I love Jesus or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But they never really understood what that meant. And I think a lot of us who are going through this revival and the truther movement now are now have an understanding of, of why we why we really do love Jesus and why we are very grateful for his grace. Because in the truther movement, it's a it's a lot of uncovering um the satanic design mm -hmm. and we love the fact that we have an escape 
from the satanic trap. Um, that had been something that was hidden from us. We didn't even know we were in a trap. We were, I think we, uh, we didn't even know a trap had been set for us. And the yeah. fact that there's, there's a possibility that someone is going to spring us from the trap or is going to make sure that, that we don't fall into the trap is something that's causing great love um, for Jesus amongst uh, those of us that are in the truther movement. Similarly, I'm wondering if the apostles felt something like that was going on with them. Is there any evidence that they felt a snare that the world had laid for them? Because if Jesus was just a cool guy, mm -hmm. if he was a great moral teacher, uh, you know, how could they have a love for him that went beyond sort of brotherly platonic love of some kind to actually see him as the Messiah. They must've been aware of similar traps set for them. And, and what was their awareness of such traps? Can you, can you speak to that at all? Yeah, I think I can. I, I think that the disciples show that's how they did love Jesus originally. When he was walking with them, they loved him as a rabbi. And, and that's why they deserted him. And that's why they betrayed him. Because they had a a respect for him as a rabbi, but they had no idea how much God loved them. That act had not yet been completed. That act was completed in the crucifixion and then later in the resurrection. That's why this is the act that God performed to complete all the prophets. All the prophets were prophesying about God's love, but God's love had not yet fully matured to the point that man could love God back in a, a such a complete way. Because now we have the personification of God in a human being. We have the capacity to love with all of our love. Before that, God was kind of a religious item. You know, we could theorize about God and we could form an abstraction of God and, and so forth. But now that we know the love of God, we can react differently. Paul says that we love God because he first loved us. This is what he's trying to say. How did he first love us? He loved us by this act of of this crucible act of crucifixion to suffer for us. So when we say, well, why would God suffer like that? Why would why would God let his son suffer like that? Uh, you know, maybe he was given some special numbness where he couldn't feel the pain. But anything would diminish the love of God. If if Christ was given any special privileges at that time, it would have diminished God's love for us. See, so now that is the motivation. That is the, the catalyst for our love. It's not just us waking up in the morning, Luke, and saying, you know, I think I'm going to be a religious Christian today and I'm going to love God. No, our love is only a reaction to God's love. And without the act of crucifixion and sacrifice, we could not love God in that way, that we love him today. Do you I completely agree. I guess what I'm trying to understand here, and I think this is actually really, this is actually super fascinating to me because I've never contemplated it before. Because you mentioned earlier that the love that they had for them was more of a rabbinic nature, if that's a word. Absolutely. More, more as a love for a teacher. And then through the process of the crucifixion and the resurrection, it seems like their attention was brought to the larger divine plan that they had been a part of. And they could see they could see what this sacrifice that Jesus had done, what it was really saving them from. And I guess what I'm wondering here, was there a moment when their eyes were open and they could go, oh, that's what this was all about. <laughs> like we thought we, we thought we knew, yeah. but it was so much bigger than we could comprehend. So like, you know, there are like, when you see a lot of these movies with plot twists, yeah. Um, like the usual suspects. Have you seen the usual suspects? Do we have any? <laughs> have you, 
Have you have you seen the movie The Usual Suspects? Oh, the oh, um, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Yeah, you would you would know if you did. There's a big there's okay. a major plot twist at the end. Uh, or have you ever seen like an M Night Shyamalan movie where there's a big twist at the end where like you you have you have it's kind of a staple of all his movies where you have a, th- a certain understanding of reality only to find out that you only had a very small piece of it and your eyes are open to the larger scale of it. Yeah. Have you ever seen one of those movies? Uh, I have seen movies like that. I can't say I've seen it, but I wrote it down because I'll see if it's on Netflix. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a great line in the usual suspects, uh, Kevin Spacey's character, uh, ironically, uh, uh, it says the greatest trick that the devil have ever performed was to convince the world that it didn't exist, which I believe is a paraphrase of a bottle air quote from a poem that yeah, we may have. Discussed. We did that. We did that one. Yeah. So what I'm trying to understand here is that were the eyes of the apostles open to the larger understanding of what was going on. And when did that happen? If it didn't happen before the crucifixion, when did that happen? Was it when, when Jesus was resurrected and he, did he be like, was he telling them secrets of the universe and the larger plan? I mean, how did they put it all together so that they could have this, they could go from abandoning him and denying him to being crucified upside down for him. I I think that we have some information to, to come up with maybe an incomplete answer, but somewhat of an answer for the most of the disciples, the resurrection, when they saw Jesus that was the moment that turned turned them around. That was the moment they realized something bigger here is definitely going on. He is the Messiah. He is truly divine. <clears throat> Except for what? Right? Thomas. He saw well, 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 t- well, Thomas got to put his fingers in the wounds. And Thomas, cool, had right? to, Thomas had to do that to prove it to himself. So maybe each one of them came in stages. There was also the stages of in the upper room when they received the power of the Holy Spirit. That must have been a a good uh, boost for them in faith as well. Uh, For Paul, he he realized that on his way to Damascus. So everybody comes to that moment maybe a little differently, sometimes in different stages. Uh, I, I may have come into it in stages but then that the last stage was a big step <laughs> it was when it really dawned on me this all came together uh the love of god came together uh that was a big stage for me uh, up until then it was little stages moving in that direction but not quite getting there and so so yeah i think it's a little different you you may have experienced it in in one big fell swoop right um, yeah, and and some people get there in a few stages, uh, so we we can't say that. But uh, yeah, the way it worked with me, and, the way it worked with me and God is God's like, oh, you want to know some stuff? Here's <laughs> like, here you, here's all of it at once. Yeah, and I was I was like, uh, uh, yeah, 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 it was it was a lot to handle. It was a lot. Well, when did was, when did you fall in love with God? Can you well, can, can you put would, that put to a point a time point in history? Well, I, I would suppose I suppose it would be what sort of conception yeah. of God. I think I've always had a love of truth and a love for the Creator, and that's what prevented me from ever falling into agnosticism or atheism. Mm-hmm. I I knew that modern conceptions of cosmology, physics, explanations for the origins of life, um, required. I mean, despite what any learned physicist, Carl Sagan, Stephen Hawking, whoever, had to say, uh, it was completely incoherent to think of a universe uh, that didn't require at least one miracle uh, and that thing that set off the Big Bang. Yeah. So I understood that at four years old. Um, I was never... So I was, uh, that always sort of preserved... There was, there was always... It always preserved a z- desire to know the creator and to know truth. Um, and then as I got older and seeking it out through philo- philosophy and science, I think I took the root of having increased reverence for sort of a demiurge sort of God, the God of the philosophers, um, which, you know, if anyone's familiar with how Pascal 
uh, had to remind himself by sewing into his coat that the God of the philosophers is not the God of I- Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <laughs> and then through the study of philosophy and finding them wanting uh, in regards to that, that was the experience when I, when I studied philosophy so intensely and every philosopher who was versed well in ancient and modern philosophy kept saying, trying to say, Oh no, no, you're projecting this, this belief into a monotheistic God onto these texts. He's not really there. Yeah. And these people only were interjecting it for political reasons. I was like, man, this is a bunk. This isn't where the truth is at. Unfortunately, that's where I found Kierkegaard and, um, I think Kierkegaard made Christ as intellectually plausible and implausible, right? That's a big part of it. Yeah. Uh, as as anyone can do. And then and then I think uh that brought brought me right up to the cusp and then God said, "Okay, you're ready." And he just gave me a bunch of information. Mm-hmm. He gave me a bunch of information. He's like he's like, "Now try to explain this." And that's how that's how I got to where I am today. That's why I'm wearing a God is love shirt right now. Oh, look at that. What <laughs> appropriate for today's lesson, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And no coincidences. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I could go into further detail, but it could be boring to people out there. But it, what's it, what's the uh what's the the verse? Um seek and you shall find. Yeah. And I I've always been a s I've always been a truth seeker and uh, at 37, God gave me information that couldn't be explained by philosophy or science. Mm-hmm. So, but, I had, I had, I had to, I had to look elsewhere. Yeah, I, I found that there was a big difference in me loving truth as an abstraction, and then loving truth as a being. And that right. that was really, I think, the, the moment of love for me. Because when you love the truth as an abstraction, it's kind of hard to love an abstraction. But when you find out truth is a, a being, a human be- has been a human being, then you love that human being because they're truth. And that is a that is a really a, 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 a one of those moments, you know, where you you really get it. That's that's really the life of because we we can love the truth that doesn't mean we necessarily practice the truth, but when you when you love the truth as a being, you you have to participate in it, and that that yeah. that changes changes our whole point of view. So that's all I've got for you today, Luke. That's it. That's it. <laughs> We're only doing an hour long lesson. It's a short, not- abbreviated. You know what? I, there's this um. There's this uh, podcast that I really like called uh, Now You See TV. They have like 80,000 subscribers. It's for, it's like real out there Christian stuff. It's not probably for your mainstream Christian. It's stuff you won't learn in church. But they do this thing called the Midnight Ride. And they so they they talk about some pretty out there theological stuff at like like uh, at midnight on Saturday nights. Yeah. We should, we might some night we might want to just do one real late one night and see where things go. Oh. <laughs> right, rather than that? the middle of the rather than the middle of the day, we might want to have a a theological philosophical jam session in, in the oh. wee hours of the morning and see what happens. I mean, unplanned and unrehearsed and un. <laughs> well, we'd be planned, but it, it, <laughs> it, it, in the, it, that late at night. That late at night, sometimes the mind can go in some pretty interesting directions. True. Yeah, I know. Now Just I know an what idea. You mean. But no, I wanted I've... to give a shout out. Okay. I wanted to give. I wanted to give a shout out to that 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 podcast. Now you see TV. Uh, okay. For anyone who uh, anyone who likes uh, rigorous theology, but also fringe subjects, uh, the good stuff. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you so much, Bob. That was that was a wonderful lesson, and. Uh, Please uh, go visit noetic.online, create an account. <sighs> I'm behind schedule with all the things I'm trying to make for everyone, but I think you'll appreciate what you can find over there. Um, it's, it's a real labor of love, and Bob has been a big part of that. And uh, hopefully by the grace of God, it's something that grows and replaces uh, some, of the, some of the currently existing... Uh, ways that we communicate commune and learn from one another or at least compliments so i hope that that happens 
Bob, you send me your file and I'll have the audio up on SoundCloud, Noetic, uh, YouTube as soon as possible. Okay, sir. All right. Take care, my friend. Okay. Blessings to you and everyone listening. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.